Welcome to Byte Chats, our series keeping you on top of what's going on in the world of Gen Z marketing. Today we're doing a sustainability special in honour of Earth Day. Gen Z's relationship with sustainability is well documented. We know they care deeply about tackling climate change. One huge culprit of waste that people aren't talking about as much is tech. Engaging Gen Z on sustainable tech has huge potential. This is the digital native generation, so where their tech habits go, everyone else will follow. But it also opens up new discussions. Can we be donating tech to charity, for instance? It's my pleasure to introduce Mariam Jukite, the founder and chairperson of Refeo. How are you, Mariam? Please could you tell me a bit about yourself and the charity you founded? I'm doing very well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, so my charity is called REFEO, which stands for Refugee Education for Equal Employment Opportunities. And as the name indicates, we support refugees and asylum seekers to get access to higher education, vocational trainings, and also jobs that are matching their qualifications. And currently we have um, a Tech for Good program uh, for, to close the digital gap for refugees and asylum seekers. And as part of this program, we donate laptops that are in good working conditions so that they can access online courses, university, work on their CVs, employment needs really. So that's what we do. And um, we call our uh, refugees and asylum seekers clients because they play an active role in everything that we do. For example, um, if we design a new project, then we consult them. Uh, in the board of trustees, we have a refugee. So we have someone with lived experience. So we make sure that the activities that we offer are very relevant. Um, and also we have an online forum where there is a peer-to-peer -peer, um, support element because refugees and asylum seekers speak to each other about subjects that really matter to them and they share their experiences so that they can all access to services that can support them in their journey. In that forum for peer-to-peer -peer advice, that's a fast, incredible idea because, yeah, especially with someone on your, on your board who has been there and knows exactly what people are going through, seems like something that lots of people don't really, like, don't have a frame of reference for, um, but being able to support each other is a beautiful thing. And um, when did that uh, launch the, the forum? So it's quite recent. So we launched the forum back in February uh, 2022. So it's been um, a month and a half, like almost two months, but it's working quite well and people are engaging with it. So we can really see the need for it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, what inspired you to start Refe? my partner, um, because he's a refugee from Sudan. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few years back, he wanted to go to university, but um, he was asked to pay to study and he didn't have the financial means. Imagine you are a refugee. How can you have that money to, to cover your student fees? This is quite impossible. Mm -hmm. So I started by looking for a few scholarships that could help him, but I couldn't find any that he fit the criteria and I realized that he was not an isolated case and there was definitely a need to have a charity like Refeo. Yeah. So and yeah and also I, I feel that because I am as well a product of immigration so I know um, the challenges that immigrants face. Um, my parents came to Europe as undocumented migrants back in the 80s uh, and it's not been very easy. So I also wanted to give back by creating um, refill and taking into account that there are some skilled refugees and asylum seekers that can give back to the UK. So it's not only equal classes that are needed for them, but we need to go further and provide vocational trainings and access to higher education. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So ESOL classes, that's English for speakers of other languages, right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah, it seems very strange that, um, yeah, that your partner wouldn't be able to access university as, as a refugee. And I, yeah, it seems like there's a lack of, um, just like a central port of knowledge where people could find out what's available to them. 
And because of that, there's loads of gaps people are slipping through because actually they're, yeah, they don't fit the criteria. And it's, it, it much must be, yeah, very difficult and um, confusing. It's amazing that, yeah, that you're doing the work you're doing. Um, could you tell me a bit more about how you started and built Record? Yeah, so it was back in 2016 when my partner was uh, facing all these challenges. And of course, you don't just wake up in the morning and decide, oh, I'm going to create a charity. So what I did is that I decided to run a marathon to present my project to the, to the world and um, taste the waters to see if people are interested and see that as something that is needed. So I ran the Manchester Marathon in April 20. 17 and uh, it was a real success like I've received funding from friends family anonymous donors uh, colleagues so it was really great and uh, overall I was able to raise 1066 pounds around that and those funds were really crucial uh, for me to start the charity uh, and also it made me accountable for for doing that because sometimes we have ideas and we don't implement them so seeing that everyone was really involved and interested um, for this to happen, then I, I made it happen. So after uh, raising the funds, I created my board of trustees, uh, we are five, and we put strong foundations for the charity um, in terms of like, how are we going to operate the different policies? So everything that you need for a charity, we put that into, um, um, into place. And then we got officially registered in April 2019. So we're only three years old. Uh, we're still quite new, but we're doing some amazing uh, things to, to support our client groups. And um, I would say that um, for us, the main challenge has been COVID uh, because we're, when we started, it was just uh, like a year before COVID, even less than a year. And all the funding applications that we had prepared focused on face-to-face -face activities. So when COVID happened, all the applications were turned down because there were other priorities and we had to rethink our model. And this is when we decided that we will focus on online activities, fully operating online, even after COVID. And this is actually an opportunity because now we're able to support uh, clients all over the UK. So it, the reach is, is incredible. Yeah, that's amazing. It's, um, I mean, the way you started the charity, um, to do it via you know, running the marathon, that must have, I mean, what an incredible thing to do. Um, what was that like? Wow, it was a mix of emotions, like um, happiness, challenging uh, myself, supporting others. So it was it was brilliant and if i had to do it i would i would do it again and also it's important because it raises awareness around the subject which is quite important yeah definitely it's yeah something that people are thinking about a lot right now is how can they support refugees and it's amazing that yeah you're already you were 10 steps ahead or what a whole marathon ahead <laughs> And um, yeah, and then to do what you've done and then have COVID, um, and it must have been quite tricky to get the word out there. Um, did you find that? Yeah, so it was, um, it was quite difficult, but what we focused on was um, as well the need for refugees and asylum seekers to progress on their lives and um, while they're waiting for a decision to be made or while they're waiting to, to get something, to get a job. Because if we don't support them, then they will just be sitting and waiting for something to happen. And obviously nothing will, will really happen during this period, which was quite depressing for many of them because yeah. we had some uh, focus group discussions uh, and really that's the sense that we, we got. And that's why we decided to continue with the projects that, um, that we had like around uh, laptop donation, mentoring, um, offering online courses, yeah. Amazing. Um, actually, on that sort of note, could you talk to me a bit about the need for tech amongst refugees and asylum seekers? Yeah, the need for tech uh, for refugees and asylum seekers is 
really huge uh, because they already face lots of barriers. So if you don't have a laptop, automatically you are excluded from certain spaces. So you can't do what I've mentioned around uh, online courses. Uh, so your education and employment is impacted. Uh, and of course, like all these opportunities that you could have had. And what we've noticed as well is that they cannot connect with their communities as well when they don't have a laptop or internet. So it's everything is interlinked. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and when we're thinking about lockdowns, um, you know, just people who are more established in the UK, um, it felt that our laptops and our phones were a lifeline in that time. Yeah. Uh, COVID really showed us how connected we are with all our, our devices. And if you don't have one, you're at a huge disadvantage. You, know, you can't um, work, you can't attend classes, and you're cut off from all your social communications as well. Does you go through that in a new country where you're trying to learn the language, you have very few or no social ties, maybe it feels like, you know, everything's stacked against you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And also during COVID, um, they couldn't even go to the library to, uh, to access a laptop. So this was even worse than any other time. So the donation was the only way for them to, to be able to have access to a laptop. Yeah, my goodness, I hadn't considered that, but of course, yeah, that would be your next step. And then you'll cut off from that too. Yeah, it's a scary time. Um, I'd love to hear the story of someone who Refeo has helped. Yes, sure. Um, so we are, uh, so we have supported and we are still supporting um, a couple from Guatemala. They are asylum seekers and they've been waiting for a decision to be made on their status for over 12 months which is quite a long time. Uh, and they've been referred to us by another organization initially because they needed um, a laptop. So what we've been doing is that we have uh, sent them uh, two laptops. So one for the husband and one for the wife because they're both taking online courses. Uh, we've also sent them one smartphone because the husband didn't have one, but the wife had one. Uh, so that's why it, it was only one. Um, and because we have a um, project with Vodafone, which means that we have free SIM cards that have 20 gigabyte uh, unlimited calls and text messages. So we sent them uh, those SIM cards so that they can have internet because they didn't have internet at all in their asylum accommodation. So these SIM cards were for their phone. And then the third SIM card that we sent with a modem was for internet like in the in the flat so the connection the quality of the connection could be really good for them and it's still a vodafone sim card um so this has been a life changer for them because uh before they had to use the small uh amount of money that they're receiving from the government to buy internet and they receive five pounds a day which is not enough to live in the uk so imagine you need to take some of this money to use it to buy internet because you need to call your family back home, you want to stay connected. Um, it's, it was really, really hard for them. And I'm quite happy that we are able to support them with that. And at the moment we are uh, supporting them with mentoring to help them with their next steps. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it's something I didn't know that the government only gives asylum seekers five pounds. Um, and I think that's something probably many people be unaware of. So the work that Refeo does means that people, you know, like, like the couple you mentioned, don't have to choose between necessities and talking to their family. Uh, what has the reception of Refeo been like? How have other charities and businesses responded? Yeah, well, the reception of Refeo has been really, really good. Uh, we have been received really well. We're part of several networks with other charities. Uh, we also receive uh, referrals from charities like the British Red Cross, Refuge Aid. So charities that are well established are reaching out to us so we can support them, uh, their clients with laptops. So it shows the needs and it also shows that we're ready to work together to support each other when it comes to activities that one charity is more, has more expertise in. So that has been quite good. 
Um, and in terms of the businesses, oh, they've been quite generous with us. Um, we've received uh, 200 laptops and over 2,000 smartphones uh, that we are redistributing. And that has been really amazing. And for me, I feel that it's quite touching and refreshing to see all these businesses that are ready to donate wow. the tech to give another life, but also it shows how responsible they are when it comes to tech waste. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's really exciting that you're getting a response. It shows that there's a lot of tech out there that could be going to better use and people clearly really connect with the work that you're doing. So um, yeah, it's a huge opportunity and great thing that you're doing. I'd love to yeah, hear a little bit more about your work with Vodafone as well. You mentioned that uh, you're giving people SIM cards. Yes, so um, internet is a luxury for some of our clients. Um, so what we did is that we started working uh, with uh, Vodafone to get uh, free SIM cards um, with unlimited calls, unlimited um, text and internet so that we could support, uh, we could support those clients who don't have internet. And most of the time, those clients are asylum seekers. And we, we also have some refugees as well uh, that need internet. Um, and I think this project goes quite well with uh, the donation of laptops because what we realized when we're implementing uh, the donation of the laptops and getting people on board for the online courses is that some of them did not have internet. So it had like the inclusivity that we wanted to create by donating laptop had its limits because there was no internet. So yes, and uh, this is when Vodafone came into the picture and we're quite happy because now we don't need to turn down any more applications of people who don't have internet. That's great, yeah, yeah. It means that it can be as inclusive as, as you want it to be. That's great. Yeah. So you mentioned you know, you've been getting um, some secondhand tech from businesses. Um, where do you get second-hand tech from? Can individuals get involved too? So we get uh, second-hand tech from both uh, individuals and companies. Usually when we receive um, tech from individuals, so it really varies, like some people wipe off the, the data, others don't know how to do it. So when they don't, we make sure that we wipe off the data before redistributing uh, the, the laptops. Um, when we receive uh, those tech from companies, most of the time the laptops have been reset to factory settings, so we don't need to do anything really. What we need to do is to uh, install the software like uh, Microsoft, uh, Windows 10. So that's what we do like as part of the prep of the, of the laptops before uh, the redistribution. So yeah, it depends like, and um, so it, it depends on the client's not the client, sorry, the company or the individual will reach out to us and then we'll ask a few questions to understand the condition of the, of the tech. Yeah, yeah, actually, um, that's something I wanted to ask was, what condition does the tech need to be in? Well, we ask for the tech to be in good condition uh, because we don't have the capacity to repair uh, old laptops that are not working. So we accept laptops that uh, have Windows 10 or above, but um, sometimes we can accept when it's less than Windows 10, for example, Windows 7, if the laptop is in good working conditions. So it really varies and we want the laptops to come with the charger because if we receive lots of laptops without chargers, then it becomes very difficult for, for us to then um, get some fundings to buy uh, the chargers. So yeah, it's really important that the, the laptop comes um, fully with the chargers. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I mean, you're a, a small new charity. Um, so while the work you're doing is you know, having an incredible reception, um, you're still working on a volunteer basis, I, I think. To... Yes, so we have um, 18 volunteers at the moment, uh, which is really amazing. Uh, because starting with only five, uh, five people in the board of trustees and now growing to having a team of 18 volunteers is, is really incredible. Yeah, yeah, but that means, you know, if you're gonna be donating your laptop, you need to do what you can to make sure that it is in a you know, good working condition 
and yeah it's it's wiped um and stuff but you have some capacity but yeah we can help out on our side as well okay that's good to know um how how does it work actually so if i have a phone or a laptop i'd like to donate what should i what should i do well it's very simple and easy so what uh, what you can do is um either reach out to us by email um, and our email is info at refill.org or you can go on our website uh, refill.org and there is a, an online form that you can complete it's very easy See, it's on the contact us page and explain to us that you want to to donate your laptop and someone in the team will get in touch and based on where you are you are located in the UK they will either ask for the uh, device to be delivered or dropped off. So it really depends where you where you live. Yeah, that makes sense. And what kind of secondhand tech um, do you need the most? I would say laptops, but we also need smartphones. Uh, laptops for both refugees and asylum seekers um, and smartphones that are most needed by asylum seekers because when they arrive uh, in the UK, they don't have anything, not even a phone. So it's for us, what we want to do is to be able to donate to them as soon as they arrive in the UK. And we do have some refugees that need smartphones as well, if the phone that they're using is not working properly and they can't afford to buy a new one. So we, we donate them uh, a smartphone as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, what are your plans for the future of Raphael? Well, we have lots of ambition. And um, so we would love to become the go-to organization for refugees and asylum seekers when it comes to closing the digital gap. And this is actually what we're starting to do with um, all the donations that we receive. And I really encourage everyone who has a laptop or a smartphone that is in good working condition to donate to us because this is not only about uh, the environment, but it's also about supporting people who really need it. And then like it's changing their lives. It's really changing their lives. It's not only a device, it's a life changer. Yeah, yeah. And that's not an overstatement because it is you know, helping them access work, education, talk to family, everything. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, if people watching this want to help um, Raphael, what's the best thing they can do? Well, the best thing that can do uh, is check in their house, check in their cupboard, if they find an old device that they have that is in, still in good working condition and reach out to us on our website or by email because we're always happy to collect those devices. And if the those devices are left in in a cupboard then it doesn't help anyone but if we donate them then people can use them to find a job um, to get access to training to go to university or really just connect with their communities and we found out that some people even use that to attend church meetings online for example yeah there's lots of things that yeah you might not at first consider but actually it makes up your life and so much of our lives are yeah in digital spaces now so yeah it makes such a difference um you mentioned the email that people can contact you on um where can people find you so we so we have our website but we're also uh, we also have social media pages on uh, linkedin on facebook as well and on twitter so we're also on those spaces um, this is brilliant. Uh, I think we'll link the ways you can find Refo so that watchers of this um, can get involved. Um, yeah, I think I think that's us. Uh, thank you so much, Mariam. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Um, thank you very much. I've learned so much, and it's such an important topic that actually doesn't get discussed as much as it really should. So um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yeah <laughs> as well for, for having me I, I feel that um we don't as a small charity we don't um have the, those opportunities to get to those spaces that allow us to really reach out to many people and i'm quite happy to have the opportunity to to, to do this interview um today and uh, telling the world uh, the amazing work that we're doing and 
really encouraging everyone to to keep donating individuals and companies as well because this is this is really helping someone you might not know you might not know the intensity of the help but it's it's huge yeah absolutely well yeah i've definitely got a laptop in a drawer that i now know where it should be going so uh yeah thank you